So welcome to lecture nine today. Um, you've done really most of the hard work for this course by now. Um, so today will be uh, a bit more relaxing, I think. Um, we will go and look at the anatomy of a microscope. And um, I will open, if I manage to, um, to, 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 to get that to work, uh, some of these websites, these interactive websites, which explain aspects of microscopy, um, just to explain um, what, what a microscope system looks like in, in real life and, and how, how, how objects look when we image them and when things are, are what we might have to do right, to operate microscopes correctly. Um, so I will talk about that and a few sort of uh, specific techniques and technologies that are required um, to get good images. Um, so if we switch to the um, to the present presentation now, um, so I just wanted to point out that in the lecture notes um, there's a quick section on geometric optics. I've already done that with you in one of the very early lectures. I've, I've, I've explained in principle how you form images. Um, you hopefully remember some of this from school, um, but in case you don't, you have all you need to know um, on these um, uh, three pages here. Um, so I won't go into that. So you 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 can you can look at those if you need to in your own in your own time. But it's useful because you know to, to we haven't actually talked about actual magnification in the instrument and and the reason for that is actually the the magnification is one one thing right we 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 want to produce an enlarged image um but of course what we did so far so you, that you can get the magnification from geometric optics so if you have a, a magnification from the objective that's 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 200, and then you have another magnification of 10 that's come in with, with that, that comes in with the tube lens. Um, then you have an overall magnification of let's say 2,000. That that's that may be too much, right? But let's say if you have um, 110, then you can get uh, about up to about a thousand in magnification. That's about the the the, the maximum you, you can do um, usefully with a standard microscope. Um, but 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 to to find out how you magnify, look look at this geometric optic stuff. Uh, but of course the important thing is not to magnify. Um, the important thing is to magnify such to diffract doesn't kill your image and and that's what we spend all our time um, working but in the end you know you may have to design um, a, a microscope system that not, not only is it good um, in terms of its imaging quality but also you need to, to have a, dis a certain magnification if your camera chip has has, has a certain size and there's certain pixels then you need to be able to select your tube lens and your objective lens um, um, correctly to get the right the right sort of image for that and so this this section gives you a, 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 a simple tutorial on that but let's turn straight into this section here which is the anatomy of a light microscope so we already um, said that microscopes can be upright or they can be inverted um, uh, and so, um, so, so you see here um, here uh, uh, is, is, is a, 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 a microscope that is upright um, on the left here let me just turn um, can you see my my mouse yes you should be able to see that um, uh, you, you can see that the 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 objectives is on top of the sample um, and you also can get inverted microscopes so here the objective sits underneath the sample and inverted microscopes are the most widely used microscopes in biology because you keep um, biological specimen in dishes uh, in water and so you and, and cells for example are grown on on thin glass slides and then you image them from below through this glass slide um, to to look into them um, so let's just look at one such microscope in a bit more detail I hope I can get this to work so let me just see whether this opens up my um, browser so this is a link now to one of these tutorial um, sites and so here you have a research microscope um, that that um, that that is shown here 
uh, a commercial microscope and you see it looks very complicated, right? So it has lots and lots of elements, optical elements and lenses in there. And, um, and actually, you know, so you think, God, we only ever plotted two lenses. But the fact is, um, we really are only interested in representing the objective here as one lens and the tube lens system as the other lens. The other ones are just relays. They are actually relatively unimportant as far as the imaging quality is concerned. And in fact, you can theoretically show that you can accurately represent any optical system like this with a, with a, a 4F imaging system. Um, it, that, that's exactly uh, doable. Um, so a research microscope like this can be used in many different ways. You have um, a light source sitting here at the bottom and another light source here at the top. Um, this light source here will be used for uh, fluorescence imaging um, and this one up here is, 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 will be used for transmission or bright field imaging. So let's go and look at transmission mode. So I'll switch over in this, in this microscope so you can see that this light path is coming on. Let me just play with the light intensity here. I can adjust that so you can see um, bits are are lighting up in, in different ways. So let's make it bright so you can see what's going on. So the light source is imaged through the condenser lens um, onto the sample. The sample sits here on this stage. You can move it left, right uh, and up and down to get the sample into focus. The um, transmitted light, so the coherent light that's refracted by the sample, a transparent cell or so, um, is then imaged through the objective. It goes straight through and then you have an option. You can slide in uh, different optical elements and send the, the transmitted light to different parts. You can either send it to your eye, so you have um, you have a tube lens here and then you have actually ocular, so these are extra lenses to give you a bit of extra magnification so it suits the the, the um, it, produ it produces a suitable image to, 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 to be looked at by eye or more, more, um, more often nowadays use a center light straight um, through a tube lens onto a camera chip um, that may be situated up here. So um, you, can also, um, you, you can also attach cameras to different ports and do different things simultaneously. Um, so, so that's all that, what that, that means. So there's a side port here, there's a front port. So you can have two or three cameras all looking at slightly different things, all optimized for slightly different signals. Um, the other way you can use this, so this is coherent imaging. Um, where the face front um, is, um, is, is, um, is, is where all the emitters in the object plane emit um, mutually coherent light. Um, and, and the other is to use fluorescence imaging. And for that you might use the, um, the, the, the light source as shown down here. The light goes, um, is reflected off what's called a dichroic mirror, which is sitting in these little um, in these little filter cubes down there. It will select a certain color. Um, it goes through an excitation filter. I've shown this in one of the early lectures. And then the right color is sent through the objective onto the sample. And this excites fluorescence light in dye molecules that are inside the sample. And now all the dye molecules that can be excited with this color, they will emit light that's red shifted, that's uh, a feature of fluorescence. So it doesn't have the same colors as the excitation light. And so by, by, by having the dichroic down there um, selected in such a way that the excitation light is sent up, but the fluorescence light is passed through, we can select the color um, that comes back and send it either again onto the eyepiece or we can look at it on the camera and take a fluorescence image and, and, and so on. And as I, as I said earlier, the great thing about this is you only get signal where a fluorophore emits light. So where you actually excite a fluorophore that gives you the signal. You, you, where, where there are no fluorophores or where they can't absorb the light that you, that you supply, you have um, a dark background and that what, that's what makes fluorescence so incredibly, um, incredibly sensitive. Um, the space between the objective and the, um, and the tube lenses here um, is called the infinity space in, the, in a 4F imaging system, essentially because between those two lenses you only have parallel light 
you can actually play and put all elements into that into that space, into that infinity space. That's why all modern mi microscopes are so-called uh, infinity corrected microscopes. So here there are these filter cubes in between. I can select, you can see I'm turning the filter cube now. So for example here I've now uh, switched it. So I have um, a different color, emission color selected. So that's a green color. So this, this would be, you see, um, blue goes in and green comes out. Um, so if I select this one here, 550 nanometers, so green goes up to the, to, the, to, the, to the sample. You can see green goes up and red is passed through and so on. So these are the kind of things, or you can excite with, with orange or, or a reddish light, and then sort of deep red light comes back um, in fluorescence. Um, so that's really what, what you might have in a, in a, in a microscope. Um, in, in the laboratory. Um, so illumination in bright field imaging and also in fact in fluorescence imaging is, is critical. You want to have good illumination and you, you want to achieve a homogeneous field inside the sample so that the sample is illuminated with the same intensity all across. Um, and you don't want to throw light onto parts of the sample that you're not interested in because that reduces contrast. You just get light coming back at you that, you're not, that you don't want to analyze. So, so picking the right um, region of interest um, is one important thing. You do that with a so-called field stop in the, in the microscope and also adjusting the amount of light you put onto the sample. You don't want it too bright, you don't want it too dark, you just want it so you get the optimal contrast. You do that with a so-called aperture stop uh, in the sample. So you can look at, you can look at some of these um, uh, um, uh, illumination modes um, in, in, in your own time uh, on the website. So for example, if you look at this here, um, the right way to illuminate is called Kohler illumination. And if you really are going to the lab um, and, and want to achieve this, um, actually, I would say 95% of um, uses of microscopes in our um, department here um, and everywhere. <laughs> this department is not special in that way. Probably don't do it right. Um, they, they do not spend enough time to get illumination correct. Um, if you really want to know how to do it properly, look at this um, um, link here so you understand what Kohler illumination means and you adjust your microscope correctly. Um, we'll have a little sample uh, example in a minute as well. So. Um, we, um, we, we said uh, actually that it's quite useful to think about conjugate planes. Uh, and so um, if, if I may, I just briefly show you again the, the conjugate planes in the microscope. Um, so if I go back to the visualizer, um, so for example, um, you may um, I just show you this briefly here. Um, so you you have a light source. Let's say you have your light source illuminating the sample. For a bright field imaging system, you'd have a point source. Um, you produce a plane wave that illuminates the object, and then so you have a parallel light coming on there. It gets focused onto a spot, as remember in the Fourier plane. That's what bright field imaging does. The illumination light um, goes is focused to a spot. And then, um, and, and then you come back to the image plane. So you can see actually that here the object plane and the image plane are conjugate planes. They, uh, they do the same information. Actually, the source plane, the light source plane, and the Fourier plane, they are both um, conjugate planes. Um, and so it's quite useful to know where these conjugate planes are in these imaging systems. Um, to get the right mode of illumination. If something goes wrong, you, you understand why it goes wrong. And of course, so if we look at, again, the other way, if we look at the sample point, sample point emits light and it's imaged onto this thing. So these two points are, 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 um, are in um, are conjugate planes. Um, and you can see that this space in between, so all the information from the object is traveling in parallel light rays. And so this is called the infinity space 
again in between here. And that's where you can put filter cubes, dichroics, um, and these other elements as we've just talked about. Okay, so I go back to the, um, to the um, uh, presentation again. Um, so you see here a, a, a microscope that's an upright system. So you look at it from the top. That may be very useful for many things. Um, it's a, usually simple microscopes are upright microscopes. Um, and um, so inspection microscopes, you, 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 you'd have something like that. Um, but um, so here's one example. It's, it's self-explanatory. But what I quickly show you is um, the, um, the, let's see, maybe we can get this to work here. Um, yeah, so here you see what happens if you, this is useful to show you uh, what, what goes wrong if you, and, and I just show you this, you can play with this in your own, in your own time, but understanding these conjugate planes, understanding where field stops are and aperture stops are that control the amount of light that goes in and that control the illuminated area. And so when th images don't look right, then go and realign the, 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 the sample. And so you have here um, essentially a tutorial, an interactive tutorial that shows you an interactive, um, uh, an interactive system that shows you um, how to align properly. So you see that the actual condenser is, is, is so you have a very dark image. And actually, you can see the condenser is really closed down. So if I open up the condenser, I, I will, the condenser aperture, I admit more light um, through the condenser onto the sample. Immediately the sample um, is illuminated more strongly. And you see that actually only a very small region is illuminated. What does that mean? And it's off center. That means two things. First of all, the field diaphragm is too small because um, you don't illuminate an interesting part of the sample. You, maybe you want to fill 80% of this, of this field of view here. So let's make it larger. Let's make the field diagram larger. I'll do that here. You can see I can open this iris. Uh, if I open it to the maximum like that. Um, so that's one thing. And the field diaphragm is actually off-centered. So there are usually knobs um, on the field diaphragm that allow you to adjust its position. So now I'm bringing in the field diaphragm um, uh, correctly onto the, onto the sample like that. So that's possibly very good. Um, actually, let's make it slightly smaller again, because there's something else. If the field diaphragm isn't sharp in your image, then it's not in the right position. And that, it, that will also degrade image quality. So you want to actually put the, the diaphragm into into focus and, and the image into focus. So let's do that. Let's focus the image properly. Um, and you can see that actually makes a tremendous difference, right, in terms of the, of the quality that we get on, on the sample, right? So this is now correctly aligned. Um, and just, just to give you this, this on the right hand is a simulation um, of the sample. So if I make the field diaphragm too large, these regions in the corners are not imaged, right, and beyond. You, they, they just don't pass through the aperture of the, of, of the optics. So illuminating them just creates stray light that you don't want to re reduce the contrast, right? Um, you can change the condenser height. You can see when you do that, if the condenser isn't right, um, then, then actually the, the image degrades very, very quickly, especially at, at, at the edges. So if the condenser is correctly aligned, the field diaphragm is exactly in, in focus because the field diaphragm is a conjugate is in a conjugate plane of the sample plane, right? That's why they both appear in focus. The aperture, the aperture um, stop, the aperture, um, uh, the, ap the, the, the aperture stop, so the field stop is in the conjugate plane of the sample plane, the aperture stop is in the Fourier plane of the sample plane. Um, look at it um, and think about it and, and see what happens. Um, the other thing is the lamp. So you can often center the illumination light source in the correct place. And so you can, you can rotate it. Um, 
So this was in the past, these lamps sources were usually these filaments and they were very inhomogeneous illumination sources. So to, to get them exactly right was very important. Today, almost universally, people now start using light emitting diodes. I mean, in new microscopes that you, that I should say that many microscopes you still have in laboratories have these filament light lamps in them. Um, but, but, but you know, more and more now they're replaced with optoelectronic um, devices. So you, you want to focus this because um, um, actually the filament, the, the light source we said, the light source itself, the origin of the light source and the Fourier plane are conjugate planes, right? So you would look at this in the Fourier plane and see, see an image actually of the light source there. Um, so you want to, to you can change the, of course the brightness of it and you can change the, the, the focus. So if I go back then um, th this, this would be a properly aligned image and you can change and look at different. So this is now it's gone back uh, so it, it, uh, it asks me to do another another um, alignment here which I'm not going to do, but you can play um, with this yourself and by playing with this actually you replicate exactly the, the thing that you need to do when you want to align a um, a practical microscope, so it's really very good. Um, okay, so so we move on. We've talked about that, but now we go to the most important part of the um, of 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 a microscope system, which is the objective. The better the objective, the better the quality of the the image. Um, Leeuwenhoek recognized this already um, a long time ago, and and so you can pay a lot of money for good objectives and we want we want to get as much light from the, the object to, uh, into the objective um, um, itself lens and one thing we need to consider there is that um, when we image things like cells and we have them on glass cover slips so typically we may have um, let's have a look. So here's a microscope slide. There's a specimen, maybe it, it's sort of sandwiched here between two glass slips. So this this top glass slip is a thin slip of glass, which is um, which is uh, um, which is really just there to to squish the sample together and to provide good optical access, right? So uh, and a flat good optical access, um, so we can image through it, and um, and and so. We image through that and then bring the objective close and focus a point in the sample. Now there is a problem with that because one problem is if 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 the um, the medium behind if the medium behind um, um, let's have a look where am I um, if the medium be between the objective lens and the cover slip is air then. Um, glass and air have ref different refractive indices and by Snell's law, which you remember from school, the angles, n sine of the angle, the incident angle is n1 sine of the incidence angle is n2 sine of the exit angle. So if, if n1 here is glass and n2 is air, um, so glass has a refractive index of 1.5 roughly and, and, and air is 1, then you, you bend the light rates quite dramatically away from the, from the cover slip. And now you see what happens. Um, if I, um, I don't know whether I can show you this, but, but so for example, light emanating at this angle here is refracted out. Can you see this? I, mean, I don't know whether you can see anything here. Um, can you see my mouse? Yes, you can see it. So the mouse is there. So if if you look at this angle here, um, the the light refracts away because the refractive index here is lower than that of glass, and actually that is now lost. It's not captured by the objective anymore. So this is really weird because you know the in air I can have quite nice large angles captured, but actually they correspond to much shallower angles from the from the sample. And effectively that reduces the numerical aperture of your lens quite dramatically. 
So the effective numerical aperture is much less than what you want and therefore the resolution goes down. So one way to change this is by changing the refractive index of the, um, of the intermediate space and match it more closely to the sample and to the cover glass. So we can do this, you can see this now. So if I make the refractive index here uh, for air it's one and now I get closer and closer to that of glass. I'm bending all these right, light rays back bending them in until I reach that of glass. Here I matched, right? And so these, there's no refraction, right, between those two, between those two, those two surfaces. And as a result, I'm actually getting a much higher re resolution than, than, than I would um, get otherwise. You can see this down here, the, the numerical aperture of this, of this um, system here with using the right refractive index in between is 1.49 numerical aperture. So um, if, you, if you look at this n sine theta, um, see theta is this half angle here is 1.49. So it's enormous. And um, if I go to air, it's only 0.9. So if you think about the difference, so it's lambda over 2 times 0.9 compared to lambda over 2 times 1.5. That is an enormous difference, right? So that is more than 60%, 70% difference in, in the resolution that you gain by matching the refractive indices. And the way you do that is by putting a, a drop of oil in between. So that's indicated here. You see the, the oil is indicated here and the refractive index is matched. So you, you put a, you, you, th this is how you do it. That's the, the importance of immersion media. So you get different types of lenses, oil lenses, water lenses, air lenses. Never make the mistake of um, using the wrong lens with the wrong immersion medium. If you have a, if you have a water lens, you put oil on it or vice versa, that's really not a good thing. Um, and that can cost you a few thousand pounds quite quickly. Um, and, and, and so be careful with that. Um, if so, I've lost a little bit of my presentation here. I'm going to go back. Um, I'm going back now to the yes to the presentation, and I um, just want to finish up. So here is um, here are microscope objectives. You can see the simple lens that we've always drawn is in fact a combination of many lenses, and and so they are they're held with high precision. You know, micro, micrometer precision in these in, in these casings here multi-lens elements that correct for different distortions. Um, and so um, you, for a good microscope objective, the best ones will have um, a numerical aperture of up to 1.5, as we've just seen in the simulation. Um, you can pay anything up to 20,000 pounds for just a little, um, a little lens that's like that. And, um, and so the, the microscope objectives are um, designed to minimize aberrations. You can read about these yourselves. Spherical aberrations, um, because lenses are made from, often from spheres, so you, you want to use aspherics to get the best, um, the best, um, the best image, images from the lenses. So you can look at the, these um, applets yourselves uh, in your own time. Um, you want to correct, color correct them, so for, for uh, chromatic aberrations. So this means um, if the refractive index from, of materials, glass and so on, changes a little bit with wavelengths. So if you image different wavelengths, for example, in fluorescence microscopy, then you will get slightly different foci for the, um, for the different colors, and that will cause degradation. So lenses that, chorus, um, that correct for spherical aberrations are called aspherical lenses. Um, lenses that correct for um, chromatic aberrations are called achromats. They are corrected for two colors or apochromats, which are corrected for three colors. They're then getting very expensive. And, and so you can see again what those are. Finally, um, lenses have to be corrected for field curvature um, because, in fact, it turns out that the optimal image um, focus is not on a plane, but it's actually on a curved space. That's called field curvature. But your camera is a chip that's a 2D plane, right? So to, to get the best possible image, um, you need to correct for that. So, so and that, that then, again, to correct for all these things is an art in itself. And, and, and um, 
new lenses are constantly still being designed using computer software and so on. And the best lenses you can buy are called pl uh, plain apochromats. Plan apochromats, plan, plan, because they're planar corrected, they're field curvature corrected, and apochromats because they're corrected for three colors and for, um, for spherical aberrations. Okay, so lenses are color coded. So if you, if you take a lens in the lab, they, 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 they have different color rings on, on, on them below. So experienced users can read from the color codes um, what type of lens it is. So red, for example, is a, an oil um, uh, or water or glycerin. So it can, can be used for all these media. If it's a yellow one, you can use it with, with, with glycerin. Um, and if it's, a, uh, um, if it's a white marked, the white ring, the lower one, it's a water lens only, and blue is a uh, black is an oil lens, right? So, um, uh, and then the, the the next band here, the next color is is um, a uh, indicates the magnification. So this is all standardized, and in fact, some automated microscopes these rings are read off um, by sensors, so that when when they can automatically switch, and then the software and the microscope knows what what lens was used. Um, more important are things like this. Um, the, the, the first you see here, this is a, a plain, uh, planar um, apochromat lens, neofluor, that's, that's a de designation from Zeiss itself, but th this, is, this relates to some of the materials that I used to correct for, for, for different chromatic aberrations. 63 times is the magnification, and, and this is important. The 63 times magnification you only get when you use the correct tube lens in combination with this objective lens because of the 4F imaging system, right? So um, Zeiss has, I don't know what the, the, the standard tube focal length is. I think it's 200 millimeters, but it may range for different manufacturers from 160 to 220 millimeters. So they all have slightly different uh, lenses. Uh, because they're infinity corrected, you have to use the right tube lens to get the correct magnification, and actually also the, the best possible imaging performance. Um, so 1.3 is the numerical aperture. DIC is for differential interference contrast imaging, so it's this lens that's optimized for a particular mode. Um, IM corrected, so that's uh, an immersion lens, and, 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 so it, and so on. This means it's an infinity lens, and, and so so correction means that you can correct for different cover slips. So this is an expensive lens. So you can actually use cover cover slips between 0.19 and 0.15 um, millimeters in, in in thickness, right? And then you adjust this color down there um, to minimize um, to minimize spherical aberrations for different cover slips and different immersion oils and so on. Um, so this is a good lens. Um, it's not the best, but it's a it's a very decent lens. It'll cost you a few thousand pounds. Um, OK. Finally, um, I just finished his lecture with one, um, with, with, with one small um, diversion going back to bright field imaging techniques. Um, you remember in bright field, you have the background of the excitation of the transmitted, transmitted light. Um, you're not interested in the light per se, you're interested in the, in the stuff that's refracted from the sample. That's the, the stuff that actually bears information about the sample. Um, but one problem is in bright field imaging that um, the contrast is very low because the objects, like uh, biological objects, are usually transparent. They're, they're very, very transparent. Um, so when light rays go through a cell, um, you can hardly see them because nothing happens to them. Nothing gets absorbed very strongly. But one thing does happen. So if you go through a small cell that may be, uh, you know, maybe five to 10 microns in thickness, the light will have slight phase changes because the refractive index of the cell, the membranes, the organelles, the nucleus, the, the cytoplasm inside the cell, all have slightly different refractive indices than perhaps the water medium that they reside in. Um, and so that's why you can see slight differences because the light gets slightly refracted. And that, that's what gives it a signal, but it's very weak. And one way to improve the contrast is to turn these phase differences into intensity differences. 
And you do that by interference, right? And there are two different methods that are widely used. One for live cell imaging, which is um, uh, phase contrast imaging, for which a, a chap called Zernike won the Nobel Prize. And um, the other is, is called differential interference contrast imaging, also used for, 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 for living cells sometimes. Um, and, and they do they work, they do similar things, but they're slightly different. And I'll very quickly explain how that works. In the first one, in phase contrast, you convert path length differences into contrast. Um, and so here, dense regions appear bright. Um, and that's, uh, I'll show you in a minute. And differential inter interference contrast converts gradients in path difference into contrast. So here you see um, you see shadows that make samples appear three dimensional, produce beautiful images, um, but you shouldn't mistake the images for a real topology map. They look like topological maps, but they're not. Uh, this is an illusion. What you're looking at is just phase phase uh, gradients. So let's look at the first one. Um, Let's look at the first method. So let's have a, let's have a, 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 a coherent illumination of a cell. Let's say the cell contains lots of different stuff inside. Um, so a light wave, so all these are in phase, the transmitted light. And then, of course, um, as it goes through um, a certain thickness of cells, for the reasons I just mentioned, um, the wave um, is slightly delayed in phase because of the refractive index. And in thicker regions, the phase delay is more. It's not very much. It's a fraction of a wavelength, right? And then as the, the, sun, as, as the light comes back together, um, you know, the, these phase differences per se are hardly, um, you can hardly see them, right, on the sample. And what the, this man here, Zernike, came up with uh, is in, ingenious because actually you, you, he turned these phase differences into intensity differences, and you get vastly improved contrast for transparent samples. So you have your blood cells. Um, so if you have a, your know, blood is red, but if you just look at a single blood cell, it's completely transparent. You know, it's only in bulk that things appear red. So they, 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 they're hardly visible on, you know, if you look at individual blood cells like this. But in, in, in phase contrast, they appear like this. It's very often used for, for, for analyzing blood. Um, or pollen grains. Actually, pollen grains in, in water you can hardly see. They're small and, and very transparent because they're so small. Uh, but in, in, this, in this method in bright field, um, in, in phase contrast, you can actually see them. And so let me just briefly explain how that works. Um, and so you can look that up again yourself. Um, but I, I go back to the visualizer here. And so the way that this works is that um, you put um, in phase contrast, what you do is you have a, a condenser that, um, that projects light in the form of an angu annular ring onto the sample. So you have a plane wave coming up onto this condenser plane and this is projected onto the sample so I'm just drawing this now um, so we have a condenser lens lens and then you have the sample plane and then as usual you have your objective and then you have the Fourier plane here and so on and so the idea now is that you this ring of light and it's coherent right it's a bright field technique. It's illuminating now the sample from these angles here. And if your cell is, is, is lying here, then what happens is that light will be... Now, let me just continue, because what you then do is you... Before I go and explain what happens here in the intermediate space, so that the light will travel through and then the conjugate plane, as we said, of the light source, so this is the light source, light source, and I say this is in a ring, this is the light source, and then the condenser takes this light source, focuses on the sample, and then the, the conjugate plane of this light source is the Fourier plane. So here, these the annular ring 
appears again as an angular ring, right? So far, so good. Um, fine. But what now happens is that the, the sample will lead to slight phase differences and re refract light, so some light will go in this direction and, and, and some will go in that direction and so on. And what you now do is on this plane up here, sorry for being a little messy here, you put what's called a phase ring. You align this phase ring and this phase ring is just a, a bit of glass and so what it does is it if if you know if you have a light wave like that it it puts a, a a phase delay delta phi on this and it puts a phase delay delta phi on this and then you remember the light that comes from the cell and is refractive that has a tiny phase delay so let's call that delta 1 delta 2 delta, delta 1 and then here perhaps this this the cell in this particular region here produces a, a phase delay delta phi 2 and what you do is that for the samples that you have, typically this will be a fraction of a wavelength. And so this, this annulus here will impart another phase delay onto illumination light such that when they come together uh, and are resynthesized in the, in the tube lens, they will be out of phase and they will appear dark, right? So you will produce a, 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 you pr 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 you'll produce a light field that is actually um, that is that 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 turns that turns regions in your sample bright, yeah. Um, that where 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 there's a slight phase delay imparted on it. So you just add a little bit extra, such that the phase differences are right for destructive or constructive interferences to be maximized. It's ingenious and it works really well, but requires very careful alignment of the. Um, condenser annulus, the light source annulus, um, the condenser itself and the phase plate, um, the phase ring in the top and then once you've done that correctly um, then, then this works really well and so you typically you, you, have, um, you have these rings that you can use for different um, these, these, these uh, condenser rings that you can use for different objectives and then the objectives have these, these, these phase plates um, put inside them. Um, the other technique, and you can look at that yourself, is phase contrast imaging, differential interference contrast imaging. Uh, it's a very popular technique used also in conjunction with um, uh, coherent confocal imaging. So here you just don't use fluorescence confocal, but you just use it, the confocal itself to, 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 look at the, um, to look at the transmitted light of, of, of a laser beam. Um, the, the principle is very simple. You just generate, you, you take the laser, and you split it slightly apart so that you actually get two parallel or, or two slightly um, angular beams that are diverging from one another just a little bit, right? So what happens is they go through different parts of the cell. And then you recombine them. And when they recombine, they have slight phase differences. And these phase differences cause interferences. And these interferences depend now on the phase differences. And so the, the phase differences will be larger when you have a steep gradient inside the sample, a, uh, you know, a thickness gradient, for example, or a refractive index gradient of some sort. And, and that appears then um, in, these, these, the, in, in these interference images afterwards as these, as, as, as these shadows. So it, it gives these distinct three-dimensional um, images of cells are beautiful. You see the, the chromatin in the middle here of the, of the nucleus where the DNA resides. You see the nucleus, it appears as if the nucleus is bulging out. And then you see the cell membrane and the cytoskeleton on these images are um, beautifully resolved with differ differential interference contrast. Here's a worm. Um, you see really nice structure inside. Beautiful technique. You can even use it on, um, on samples that are not transparent in reflection mode. That's possible. Um, but don't mistake these images for giving you information about the actual thickness or topology. That's an illusion. Um, that is just because the, the shadows appear always to one side because you are shearing the two beams um, in one particular direction. So it will pick out the gradients in that one direction and not the others so much. And, and uh, that gives you contrast and it's beautiful and it's very useful, but, um, but interpret it with care. And with that, I have actually finished my lecture nine. Um, thank you very much, and um, I'll see you next time.